Okay, so I'm going to be going through some of the review questions. I'm going to try to see if I can get through all of them. It'll depend on how long the video ends up being. Um, therefore, I am going to go kind of quick as I go through the video. So if I kind of go a little bit too fast through a problem, just feel free to pause it, kind of go backwards as you need. I'm going to kind of read some of these off. So for question number one, um, so we have the study. Um, and the first part asks us to describe the population. So in the study of what they're doing is they're trying to figure out basically the effectiveness of morphine. So they gave some people morphine, some people the placebo, um, which the placebo was um, the salt water injection. So it's basically just a fake drug. <clears throat> and they found out that the people who were taking the salt water injection found just as much pain relief as those who were getting the morphine. So for part one, describing the population. So the population is basically everybody that it's trying to represent. So in this case, the way that I describe it is the population is essentially all patients who have pain because those are the people who are going to be taking the painkiller. For the second part in the sample, the samples are just, that's just the people that are involved in the specific study that they're doing, okay? And they're using that sample to describe the entire population. For part three, describe the placebo in the experiment. So the placebo is the fake drug, so that's the salt water injection. For part four, describe the placebo effect in the experiment. So the placebo effect basically is a phenomenon where some people who end up taking a placebo still end up finding pain relief. Even though there was no actual painkiller that they took, their brain essentially thought that they were, and so therefore it ended up uh, relieving some of their pain. For the next part, the treatment group, uh, the treatment group are just those who got the morphine. So those who actually get the drug in the study, that's the treatment group. The control group for the next part can mean one of two things. It can mean a group that you just do absolutely nothing to, or in this case, it's the one that you give the placebo to, because we want to find out what happens under just normal circumstances. Now, the last part for this question, do we know from the description whether the experiment was single blind or double blind? And if not, what information would we need? So as of right now, we do not know. A single blind study simply means that the people who are receiving the drugs have no idea if they are getting the placebo or if they're getting the actual drug. A double blind study means that um, those individuals do not know, but the people who are administering the drugs also themselves do not know. So they just don't give us that information in the problem. So as of right now, it's uh, we just simply don't know. Okay, so I hope that this made sense for the first one. Okay, so in the next problem that we have, sorry, I'm just flipping my screen. Um, so suppose we take a random sample of number of balls in an old-fashioned lottery machine. So the numbers that we get are 11337. So for part one, the question asks us to find the mean. The mean is the average. So all we're going to do is add these together, divide by how many numbers there are. So we do 1 plus 1 plus 3 plus 3 plus 7, uh, which that's going to give us 15. There's a total of 5 numbers. So we do 15 divided by 5, which is 3. So that's going to be the mean. For the second part, we're asked to find the standard deviation. So I'm going to write this kind of as a table. The first thing that we do with standard deviation is we find the mean, which we found in part 1. Now we are going to take every x value, which are each of these, minus x bar, which x bar is the mean. So we take each of these, subtract the mean. So 1 minus 3 gives us negative 2. 1 minus 3 is also negative 2. 3 minus 3 is 0. 3 minus 3 is 0 again. 7 minus 3 gives us 4. Now in the next column, we're going to take each of these values, and we are simply going to square them. So negative 2 squared is 4, so we get 4 again. 0 squared is 0, we get 0 again. 4 squared gives us 16. Okay? Now, of the way that we find the standard deviation is we take the sum of this column. So 4 plus 4 gives us 8. 8 plus 16 gives us 24. We divide this by n, where n is the number of terms that we have. So once again, we have five numbers and then we take the square root. So this, we just take and plug this into the calculator, which gives us approximately 2.19. So that is what our standard deviation is going to be, okay? Uh, for the next part, the question says, 
um, if the sample is representative, what does that mean? So a representative sample essentially just means that it's a good indicator of what would happen in the actual um, population, okay? So uh, since we were just randomly drawing these numbers, this is not necessarily a good representation because if we have um, every single one of these has a selection of numbers zero through nine, the odds of this specific combination occurring again is very small. Okay, so this is an unlikely scenario that we would be able to replicate. And then the last part for this one, um, if the sample has bias, what does that mean? That basically just means that there is some type of manipulation that's done either in asking questions or the way that the study was done <clears throat> to try to draw a specific conclusion um, or to try to misinform the actual, uh, the people doing the experiment or the people that are interpreting the results. Okay, so I hope that this one made sense. Okay, so in this next question, we're asked to find the probability of some different things happening. So in the experiment, they say that for this particular trial, we're drawing one card out of a deck. So the first question says, what is the probability of drawing a king and an ace? Well, those are two separate cards. So the only way that this could happen is if we were able to draw more than one card. Since it said in the trial, we're just drawing one card, that means that this is impossible. So therefore, the probability of this happening is zero. Now, the next one, the probability of a spade and a face card, okay? So the spades are one of the uh, suits in the deck. So there's a total of 52 cards. There's four suits, so each uh, suit has um, 13, okay? There's 13 cards. So that means that there's 13 spades. The face cards are jack, queen, and king. So that means if we want both of these happening at the same time, we have to have a either a jack of spades, queen of spades, king of spades. So that means that there's three total possibilities out of 52 total outcomes, okay? So you can leave it like this or you can divide it in the calculator to get the percentage. Now for the next one, the probability of a king or an ace. So what we're going to do when it has the word or is we're going to add together the probabilities that they individually happen. So the probability of a king plus the probability of an ace, and then we subtract, oops, this is plus, then we subtract the probability of both king and ace. So the probability that we get a king, there's four total kings in the deck. So that is four out of 52. The probability that we get an ace is also four out of 52. Now the probability that we get both a king and an ace, we figured that out here, that was zero. So if we combine these all together, we get eight out of 52. Good. Now for the last one, a spade or a face card. So once again, we'll do the probability of a spade. So there's a total of 13 spades in the deck. So we'll go 13 out of 52. Add that to the probability that we get a face card. So once again, that's a jack, queen, or king, but we have the four different suits. So three times four, that gives us 12. And then we subtract the probability that both happen. Well, we figured that out in the second part. The probability that we get both at the same time is three out of 52. So now we just combine these together. So 13 plus 12 gives us 25, minus three gives us 22. So those are the individual probabilities. Okay, so for this next one, this question is asking about the lottery. So we have three outcomes, the grand prize, second place, third place. These are the payouts that they have, and then these are the probabilities of uh, having each of those payouts. So for the first part, the question wants to find the probability that we win nothing. So that means that the probability that we do not get either first, second, or third. So the way that we are going to do this is we are going to add together these probabilities because that would essentially be the probability that we win something. And then we're going to subtract that from one, which represents 100%. So one minus the probability of something equals the probability of nothing. So we take one minus this number, minus this number, 
and minus this number, and that gives us 0 0.9947862. So approximately 99.5% chance that nothing happens. We don't win any amount. For the second part, if the lottery ticket costs $7, then find the value of each outcome for the player. So for the grand prize, since we have to pay the $7 for the ticket, all we're going to do is just take each of the winnings and just subtract the $7 from that. So if we subtract that here, we get 99. Oops, sorry, we get... So 9,999,993. For second, if we take second, we just subtract $7 off of this. So that gives us $9,993. For third place, if we subtract $7 off that, we just simply get $93, okay? Now for part three, calculate the expected value of the lottery. So for expected value, this is essentially the average amount that we expect to win if we play the lottery once. So the way that we do this is we're going to take each of the winning amounts and multiply those by the probability that they happen, okay? So we're going to take this winning here and multiply it by the probability that we win that, which was this probability here. And this is a positive amount because in this case, we earn money. Now for the next one, we're going to add that to this amount multiplied by the probability that we win it. Then we're going to add it to this amount. So plus 100 times the probability that we win that, which is 0 0.005. Now, there's still the probability that we win nothing. So we add these ones together, but then from this we are going to subtract our losing amount. So if we play the lottery and if we lose it, we lose the $7 that it took to play it. But we need to multiply this by the probability that we win nothing, which we calculated in part one. Now we take this entire thing and plug it into the calculator, and that gives us $375.60. So what that tells us is if you play the lottery once, your expected value that you would expect to win is $375.60. So it makes it seem like it's worthwhile to play the lottery. But the reason that your expected value is positive is just because the grand prize payout is so big. You would have to keep playing this a lot of times in order to really expect to win any money because you only win money if you place in the top three. So for the next part, it says um, explain what the expected value means. That's essentially what this means. It's the amount of money that we expect to win if we play it once. Sometimes it makes sense, sometimes it doesn't make sense. In this case, if we were to just play the lottery once, we're really not going to win $375, okay? But if we play it a ton of times, so like thousands, hundreds of thousands, you know, uh, so on and so forth, if we play it that many times, then on average, we can expect it to come out to this amount because mathematically, eventually, we will end up winning that grand prize. Okay? Now for the next part, if you are given the choice between playing the game once and playing it many times, which would you choose? Always choose to play it many times. If you play it once, this is your expected value, but the odds of that happening are so slim. You have essentially a 99.5% chance that you're going to win nothing, so you have roughly a half percent chance that you would win anything at all, okay? So if you only play it once, your probability of winning is low. But if you play it a lot of times, then on average, you can expect to earn about this amount every single time that you play, once again, as we average it out, okay? Okay, so the next one for question number five, now we're going to practice some normal distribution. So 60 students were given a history exam, their scores were follow normal distribution, the mean or the average is 77, and the standard deviation is 8. So for part A, if a student earns a score of 88, what is the z-score for this raw score? So the way that we calculate z-score, z is equal to x, which is the score, 
minus mu, which is the mean, divided by sigma, which is the standard deviation. So in this case, the score that the student got was 88, minus the average, which was 77, divided by the standard deviation, which was 8. So 88 minus 77 gives us 11. So this would be 11 over 8, or you could write this as 1.375. So that is the z-score. So now for part B, if a I'm sorry, uh, what is the percent of students who score above and below 85? Um, write both as a percent rounded to one um, decimal place. <clears throat> um, so it says to use the z-scores for this one. So for this one, we're using that table um, that I attached in the announcement. So the percentage, the first thing that we have to do is we have to compute the z-score. So we're going to do that just like what we did up here. Um, so for the first part, we want the probability that x is less than 85. Now when we're looking at that table, the table is assuming that x is less than the number. Okay. So for the first part, this is exactly what we want. So now we're going to compute the z-score just like what we did up here, but now our x value is 85. So we're going to do 85 minus 77 over 8. So this gives us 8 over 8, which actually just simplifies to give us an even 1. So now you look at that z-score table where it has all the probabilities, and you're going to find the z-value of 1.0. That gives us a probability of 0.8413. So that would be 84.13%. Now the probability that x is greater than 85, anytime you see greater, you always have to do 1 minus the probability that x is less. Because the part of the table that we're looking for, so we have our normal distribution, when we're looking at the curve, we have the z-score of 1, which remember that means that we're 1 standard deviation above the mean, and then we shade everything that's less than it. So this area is 84.13%. So if we want greater than, we just take the 100% and subtract this amount here. So since we found that out in the previous part, we just take 1 minus 0.8413, or you could take 100% and subtract 84.13%, but either way, we get 0.1587 or 15.87%. Okay, so that is what we do for this part. For part C, what percent of the exam scores are between 70 and 90? So anytime we're dealing with something that is between two numbers, we take the probability of the bigger number minus the probability of the smaller number. So since we're looking between 70 and 90, we're basically going to take the probability that x is less than 90, subtract the probability that x is less than 70. So that means that we're going to have to compute the z-score for both of these. So for the 90, we'll do 90 minus 77 over 8. And then for 70, we'll do 70 minus 77 over 8. These are going to represent the two z-scores. So this gives us 13 over 8, which is approximately 1.63. And then if we subtract these, we get negative 7 over 8, which is approximately negative 0.88. So these are the z-scores. So now we go back to the table to figure out the probabilities. So we look at the z-score of 1.63, and that probability is 0.9484. Now we go to the z-value of negative 0.88, and that probability is 0.1894. So now we subtract these two probabilities at the end, and that gives us 0 0.759, so 75.9%, okay? So that percentage of students are within those two scores. Now for part D, what z-score would, or I'm sorry, what score would a student need if their z-score is a 2.3? So we're going to go back to the z-score computation. We know that our score is 2.3, this equals x, which is the score, which we do not know, minus 77 over 8. So we're going to compute what score this would actually be. So we're going to multiply the 8 
So we'll do 2.3 times 8, and then we'll add over the 77. Now when we do that in the calculator, we get 95.4%. So that's the score that the student got to get the z-score of 2.3. Now remember, a z-score of 2.3, that means that the score is 2.3 standard deviations above the mean. So we expect it to be a pretty high score. Now, the last part for this one, for part E, John and Mary both took tests on the same day. John scored 85 on the test in this class. Mary took a different test in a different class and scored an 81. Um, if it was known that the distribution of Mary's class data had a mean of 76 and a standard deviation of two, who scored better in comparison to their class? Okay, so, is this? So we'll break this up to John and then Mary. So for John, we're using the same data that we were using from the previous uh, part. His score was an 85. So we'll do 85 minus 77 over 8. Now for this part, um, we actually did this back in part B, the same exact computation, and that ultimately gave us a score of 84.13%. Okay, so that's ultimately what the score was. We did that uh, same thing in part B. Um, for Mary, her score was an 81. Subtract the average for her class, which was 76, divided by her standard deviation, which was 2. So if we divide these, that gives us 2.5. Now we go back to our z-score table, and that gives us a z-score or I'm sorry, that gives us a probability of 99.38%. So her percentile was a lot higher despite her actual score being lower. So even though she scored lower on the test, in relationship to the rest of the class, she was one of the highest scores on the test. Compared to John, he was approximately the 84th percentile, so he still did very well, but he was not in the top roughly 0.7%. Okay, so I hope that this one made sense. Okay, these next two should go by pretty quick. So for question number six, identify the most relevant source of bias in the situation. A survey asked the following. Should the mall prohibit loud and annoying rock music in clothing scores catering to teenagers? So the bias there is um, the way that the question is being asked. The question says it's loud and annoying rock music, and so that will kind of influence what the people think of the type of music. So it kind of puts a negative connotation on it, in asking should the mall prohibit this. So for people who don't really know anything about the situation, that would kind of lead them to think, yes, they should probably ban it if it's loud and annoying. Okay, so that's the source of the bias. For number seven, does, the, um, does this describe a observational study or an experiment? The temperature on a randomly selected day throughout the year was measured. That is just something you can look at a thermometer and just write down the value. So that means that that is an observation. An experiment, you usually have to set up trials, and there's usually something that you're testing for. For this, you're simply just writing down what the number is, so you do not have to worry about that being an experiment. Okay, so now for number eight. So they give us a table that has a whole bunch of scores for a math test, and there's a few different parts. So the first part, they want us to complete a frequency table for the math scores. So a frequency table just shows the number of times each of those scores occur. So if we look at all of the different scores that we see, we see scores of 30, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, and 100. Now the frequency is just the number of times that these scores occur. So the score of 30, there was only one person who got a 30, there were four people who got a 50, three got a 60, six got a 70, five got an 80, two got a 90, and three got a 100. So this is going to be your frequency table. The next part for the histogram, the histogram is essentially just a different type of table that we have. So along the x-axis, I'm going to put the different scores. So I'm going to start with 30 right here, and then each tick mark is going to be 10. So we're going to do 40, 
50, 60, 70, 80, 90, and then this will be 100. Your y-axis is going to be the frequency. So the lowest frequency that we have is 1, the highest frequency that we have is 6, so I'll just make each tick mark represent 1. So a 0 at the bottom, so then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So the 30 has a frequency of 1. The next one at 40, there's actually not a score for 40, so we're going to skip that. At 50, there were 4 people. So we have 40, 50, we're going to go up to 4. So 1, 2, 3, 4. The next one at 60, there were three. So there's three. The next one, um, there were six. So we'll go up to six, which was the very top. The next one had five. So just one below. Uh, the next one had two. So we're right here. And then finally at 100, we were up to three. So this is our histogram. So it's basically just taking the frequency table and making a bar graph out of it. For part C, we now want to make a pie chart of the data. So this is basically a visual representation of what percent each of these make up. So I'm actually going to do this in the frequency table. I'm going to do the percent. So the way that we'll compute the percent is we'll start by adding together the total number of scores that we have. So if we add all these together, that gives us 24. So 1 divided by 24 is approximately 4%. 4 divided by 24 is approximately 17%. Now, some of these are going to give you decimals. I'm just rounding for the sake of this problem. Then we do 3 divided by 24, which is 13%. Next one would be 25%. Next one would be 21%. Next one would be 8%, and then the last one would be 13%. Okay, so now we would just draw each of these percentages on it and then label them. So I'm going to start with the 70 because 25 is easy to do. 25% is 1 fourth. So this chunk is going to be the 70%. Now I'm going to do the 80s because that was 21%, so that is just a little bit less than a quarter. Now the next ones that we have, we have 50, uh, which was 17%, so that's going to be kind of a smaller chunk. So we have 50 done, 70, 80. Both of these are 13%, so pretty close to the same size. So one of these will be the 60s, and then one of them will be the 100s. Then the next percentage that we have is 8 and then 4. So go 8%, 4%. So this will be 90, and then the last one will be 30. Now, ideally, you would do this like in different colors or something, so you would have that visual representation, but it just represents the relative size that each of them are. Okay? Now, the last part for this one, we want the five number summary, and then we want to sketch a box plot. So for the five number summary, the first two numbers that we need are the minimum and the maximum. The minimum is 30. The maximum is 100. Now we need to find the median. I'm actually going to erase this part here. So we had min was 30, max is 100. So now for the median. The way that we compute which number will be the median is we take n plus 1 and divide it by 2, where n is the number of terms that we have. So we have 24 numbers. So if we do 24 plus 1, that's 25. 25 divided by 2 gives us 12.5. Now if this is a whole number, so pretend like this was just 12, that would mean that the 12th number in the sequence is the median. Since it's 12.5, that means that you take the average of the two numbers surrounding it. So you take the average between 12 and 13. So 
we always go from smallest to biggest. So our first term is 30. Second, we have a total of four terms that are 50. So we have 30, 50, 50, 50, 50. Next ones are 60, so 60, 60, 60. Next ones are uh, 70, so we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay, so the 12th and the 13th term were both 70. So that means we just take the average of 70 and 70, which if we add the 2 together and divide by 2, that just gives us 70. So I'm basically just using the table to count them out. If it's easier for you, you can just line the numbers all the way up from smallest to biggest and then just count, okay? Now we have the first quartile and the third quartile. So for the first quartile, the way that we figured this out is we do one-fourth times n. So if we do one-fourth times 24, that is going to give us six. Now, if this gives you a decimal, you round up to the whole number that's above it, and that is the number term that you take. If you get a whole number like this, you're going to take the average between this term and the term that comes after it. So we're taking the average between the sixth term and the seventh term. So the first term was 30, the next four terms, so up to the fifth term is 50, then the sixth, seventh, and eighth term are all 60. So since the sixth and the seventh term are both 60, that means that our Q1, or our first quartile, would be 60. For Q3, we take 3 fourths times n. So if we take 3 fourths times 24, we get 18. So we're looking, since uh, this is a whole number, we're going to take the average between the 18th and the 19th term. So we'll find the 18th term. So we have 1 plus 4 gives us 5 plus 3 gives us 8, plus 6 gives us 14, plus 5 gives us 19. So the 18th and 19th term are both going to be 5. So that means that your Q3 is going to be the term with the 5, which was the score of 80. Now we draw the box plot. So for the box plot, we put the minimum and the maximum. So we have 30 and 100. And then we put Q1, the median, and Q3. So we'll do 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100. So we want one at 60, so 40, 50, 60 will be right here. The median is at 70. And then this one was at 80. So we put a box around those three middle terms, the Q1, the Q3, and the median. So this is what our box plot would look like. Okay, so I hope that this one made sense.